Okay, we're ready. Jimmy D and the Wolf podcast. I'm still adjusting to the bell. <laughs> exactly, yeah. A little bit of Asian influence. I have a lot of, spent a lot of time in Asia. I lived in Japan for two years. Nice. There was a day when I spoke fluent, there was a day when I spoke fluent Japanese. Wow, I didn't know that. You didn't know that? No. Yeah, I used to negotiate. I know you lived in Asia, but I didn't know you spoke Yeah, my Japanese, Japanese and I worked really, 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 really hard at it. I bet. I, um, I'd study Japanese all day when I wasn't working, when I was there. And I got my Japanese to the point where I negotiated business contracts. Nice. Now, th- that, th- that may sound more impressive than it is because there's a certain framework of language that you use. But I could go out to the, the local pub or whatever, and they'd be using slang and maybe muttering. Mm-hmm. and not Because when you're in a business setting, you're proper, right. and you enunciate your words. Sure. And you, you use probably sophisticated language, but the enunciation, understanding... But what happens when you, you've spent a little bit of time in bars, Jimmy, playing? A little bit. Do people talk clearly when they are in a bar? Until a certain point. <laughs> <laughs> it gets worse as the night progresses. Yeah. It anyway, becomes my, broken English. You know, my point is slang or maybe, uh, there we go again. We got the fire, fire uh, housekeepers putting new batteries in the... Our, uh, smoke, smoke detectors. detectors, thank you. Anyway, yeah, and so the slang, you know, you could snow me with slang because, you know, people not speaking, you know, more proper, proper Japanese. you know, uh, uh, that 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 was another level that I didn't reach. But, you know, I could communicate. I could go to restaurants, I could order, I could do all that stuff. Nice. I mean, I could communicate with anyone on the train. They would recognize that I'm a gaijin, not Japanese, so they would tend to speak. But if they were having two of them were having a conversation and they're like slurring and everything, especially if they drink a little bit, and the Japanese drink a lot, right? They're probably right up there with the Irish. Oh, I doubt that. <laughs> <laughs> and nice you can say try, that because- Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> and you can say that because you are Irish. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So you're talking about your own kind. <laughs> yeah, you're allowed to say it. <laughs> yeah. So songwriting. When did you start writing songs, Jimmy? Oh, man. Probably 21 years old. 21, 22. So about 20 years ago, 21 years ago. 21 years ago, I started writing because uh, older musicians that I respected a lot would come to... Uh, the biggest one was Dennis O'Neill, a guy from my hometown. He played drums with Lonnie Mack, and he had played with Stevie Ray Vaughan and Albert Collins and just some incredible musicians. He'd played with Clapton before. And he had come to listen to us do our cover band thing. And right out of the gate, he's like, you know... You're playing these songs note for note that most people can't play note for note. You need to do your own thing. You need to write your own songs. And then what that led to is I was at my friend's wedding reception one day, shortly after becoming acquainted with Dennis, and Lonnie Mack just happened to come to town. And they call me at this wedding reception and uh, said, Lonnie Mack is here, and you need to come over here so you can meet him and play some guitar with him. So I wow, show up. Wow, you never told me this story. Yeah, wow. yeah, it was great. It was incredible, really. I have uh, some really cool pictures of it. So I show up, and it was at the bar that my mother ran in Madison, Indiana, called the Next Door Lounge. And I show up, and there's Lonnie, and there's Dennis, and a friend of mine, Joe Perkinson, and... Uh, Buzzy for great players. There's lots of great players around Madison. Something in the water, man. There's only 13,000 people there, but there's lots of incredible musicians. So I show up, and uh, I get to sit in and play some guitar with Lonnie Mack, who, of course, you know, and and at that age, the only guitar player in the world at that time in my life was Stevie Ray Vaughan. He was the only guy. I mean, there was Hendrix, and I'd kind of been through a Hendrix phase, but at that time, Stevie was my guy. And I knew how influential Lonnie Mack was. Yeah, talk a little bit. To, there may be listeners who who's Lonnie Mack. Never heard of him. Just give a thumbnail. Lonnie Mack. 
Lonnie for Mac, our listeners. Lonnie Mack was probably the first guitar player that took the flat picking techniques of bluegrass pickers and implemented it into blues and rock and roll. He was probably the very first guitar player that was seriously just attacking the guitar, playing a lot of notes, picking every note that he was playing with flat pick technique. It wasn't like B.B. King where it was, you know, really just singing. It wasn't T-Bone Walker. It wasn't Chuck Berry with the double stops. Lonnie was a completely different animal, and he was the first of his kind. He played a 1,000 notes a minute, which was the appeal to Stevie Ray. That was his biggest influence to Stevie Ray Vaughan. And Lonnie was the first to do that. Interesting side note is uh, there was an old blind guy from Aurora, Indiana named Ralph Estrada. And Ralph was where Lonnie got most of that technique from. So it's like we've, we've, talk, we've discussed this many times. The ones that innovate are rarely the ones that get credit for it. It's they'll influence somebody or teach somebody and they'll go off and innovate. It's like the, the Tesla versus Edison thing. But Ralph Estrada was where Lonnie got that stuff. And when you say Tesla versus Edison, you're talking about not today's Tesla. You're exactly. talking about eight, exactly. 1910 Nikolai, or Tesla, whatever. Well, yeah, 1908 or whatever it was. And, and Tesla invented everything, and yeah, Edison did. got he the did. credit for everything. Yeah. And it was the same sort of scenario. You know, I'm not downplaying Lonnie's importance because he was a very integral guitar player, but, you know, that way of guitar playing. And then he was the guy at King Records in Cincinnati where there was lots of great music coming out of there and lots of great Cincinnati musicians were influenced. One, which is this is such an odd connection that I never would have made until many years later that Bootsy Collins was really influenced by Lonnie Mack. Hmm. Yeah, Bootsy from Parliament, James Absolutely. Brown, all that stuff. Because he was a Cincinnati Didn't guy, know that. too. Yeah. yeah. So, anyway... I go to the uh, next door lounge and I get to play with Lonnie and he took a liking to my playing and we had this great conversation afterwards. We're sitting there, we're drinking beers and I'm, I'm a baby, man. I'm like 21, maybe 22, something like that. And uh, I said, man, what advice could you give me? And Lonnie Mack said, well, he said two things. He said, first off, quit listening to... Stevie Ray Vaughan, quit listening to Eric Clapton, quit listening to Jimi Hendrix. Wow. And I was blown away by that. And he said, figure out who they listen to, and then figure out who those guys listen to, and then figure out who those guys listen to, and just keep tracing it. Just keep tracing it back. Keep tracing it back. Keep tracing it back. And he was absolutely right, because once I took that approach, it didn't take long to be like, who did Stevie Ray Vaughan listen to? Who did Hendrix listen to? And the first guy I found was Albert King. Yep. And I was like, oh, well, they like two thirds of what they're playing. They're just playing Albert King stuff. Yep, and Albert King I, licks. And then I found like one. Buddy Guy, you know, yeah. and all these other guitar players, uh, Magic Sam and, you know, Hubert Sumlin and, and lots of them. And as you dig deeper, sometimes it gets, you know, it just branches out and gets better. But that was one piece of advice that he had. And the other piece of advice he had was, uh, he, he told me his exact words. He said, you've got the picking down. He said, you just need some of your own songs. So that was inspiring to me. It was like, well, I need to write some songs. Because Lonnie Mack, who in my mind, uh, 100%. Yeah. And he said, well, you've got the picking down. Just write some songs. So that's what kind of spearheaded me writing songs and it's been tons of trial and error because I had no background as a writer or nobody to really write with in Madison. So I just started, you know, it's like the old saying, you come up on a farm and I'm sure you've heard this before, like if you want to figure out how to do something, start messing it up. You got to start doing it wrong before you can really learn how to do it right. And that's exactly what my path has been and music is just lead with your chin and, you know, and I wrote some clunkers some serious clunkers some of them i can't even bear to listen to and some of the ones i wrote back then i listened to i think man that's better than i remembered it but that's what got me started with it was that little piece of advice coming from one of my absolute guitar heroes and then the fact that he was you know i'm a hoosier boy and the fact that lonnie mack came up right up the road in aurora indiana was i took a lot of pride in that him even being willing to sit down and talk to me and having advice with it was it was huge so it's kind of what got me going with it you're off mic probably 
I mean, you were down there. Huh? <laughs> you oh, were so, I was all like, yeah, sorry, man. <laughs> I was trying to fix my socks. My socks slid down. My socks slide down on my boots sometimes. <laughs> Did you ever see Lonnie Mack again? Yeah, absolutely. After that, uh, he came back to Madison a few times. An interesting story, like, Madison, you've been to Madison. It's yes, this beautiful yes, little town. Yes. It's like a historical national landmark. An interesting story is the guy that was playing drums with him the night that I met him was a man named Rex Ludwig. And Rex had played on and off with Willie Nelson for many years. Rex Ludwig came to Madison, Indiana and never left. Hmm. Never left. Passing through, stopped there, and the dude fell in love with the town. He said, this is my favorite place. I love the people. I love the town. And he ended up spending the rest of his life in Madison. Right? Amazing stuff. It is, man. It's fascinating. And a lot of people do that. I've met a lot of people that come to visit and say, hey, we're moving here. Because <laughs> it's just great people there. But I had seen him a few times after that. Never, you know, where I wanted to see him was 10 years later when I was starting to put it together a little bit more. And by then his health was failing and we just never made that connect again but I wanted him to hear where I was at and you know now I've got some of my own songs my playing's getting better but it was a very powerful thing to me for him to say that to me especially at that point in my life absolutely you know and I was playing guitar non-stop 21 I wasn't putting it down I mean I didn't have kids or any real obligations I was just playing gigs so it was in my hand constantly and watching videos of guys like him trying to figure out what they were doing. You know, and it's interesting now, like with the younger people, that exchange of information. Like now, here's one thing I see with some of my students, some of my private students that I've noticed. Like, guys will say, and I'm not, I hate to... Uh, lump everybody into one group because not everybody's like this, but it's just something that's changed in the last 20 or so years because of YouTube and because of information being so accessible. Now it seems more like younger guitar players, they'll say, well, I want to learn this uh, Eric Clapton song. And they'll pick their favorite Eric Clapton song and they'll learn, say, like Cocaine. Then they'll learn the solo to Cocaine, the whole thing. And that's it. And then I'll feel like, well, I've got a handle on how Eric Clapton approaches a guitar. And that's not how it was 20 years ago or any time before that. It was like, if you got a tape, you learned the whole tape. You dug in and learned the whole thing. Or if you got a, a, a tablature book, you learned the whole tab book. Or, and, and it would help guitar players get a handle on how they really did approach it. Now it's like they'll, they're just getting little pieces of the pie instead of the whole thing. So influences are coming off differently to younger players because of the uh, accessibility to information. It's just something I've observed with students. Hmm. So what? Uh, most of your students were what age? I mean, do you have any right All now? All over the place, man. I haven't been doing private lessons. A lot of that is because of the things we've been yeah. Doing it. And, anyone can learn guitar.com. Yeah, anyone. Sign up. Exactly. Anyone can learn guitar.com. So instead of teaching, at one point I had over 100 students, man. Private students, 30 minutes a day, which was. That yes, was just, that's crazy. It is crazy. But it was, uh, there was no balance to it. You know, I was teaching so much. I was teaching 50 hours a week and doing four or five gigs. A week. In, yeah, 100 students, half an hour. That's 50 hours. That no, is. Yeah. And that does not include, I mean, you can't go, you can't do 16 lessons in eight hours. No, there's no way. You can't. I mean, you Sometimes gotta, they run over. They never go short. Yeah. You're always running over. And then the goodbyes and getting one out right, and one right, in right, and the right, whole bit. Yeah. And somebody's 15 minutes late and your whole day's shot. And you're frantically sending messages. Well, now I'm an hour behind. Because this lesson went 10 minutes late, and this person showed up 15 minutes late. So now somehow we're in some weird time pocket. Yeah, the, what a lot of people do, when I took my sax lessons, or even I actually took some vocal lessons online with a woman in California, and it's through another app, 
So it kind of takes, because you hate to be the bad person. You become friends with this person. Mm -hmm. But you use an app. I don't remember the online lessons or something like that. And I, they take a cut. I don't know what they take. Hopefully it's not more than like 8 or 10% or 5%. But you schedule there using an app and you buy 30, uh, 30 or four lessons at a time, a month at a time. And it's scheduled. And uh, it starts at that time, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, 2.30 and two thirty, you know, you, uh, you know, you, you, if you're late, that's your time. Not right. That's that's the, the you students' have time. To do, not the you have to do it that way because people can be incredibly inconsiderate. I would get messages at two thirty for the two thirty lesson. Not gonna make it. You know, people are super rude about that. So you have to get their money in advance. You have to and get stuff. in advance, yeah. But at that point, when I had that many students, the ages were all over the place. Oh, were they? I was teaching what was kids. The youngest? What was the oldest? Uh, I think I had a few that were like six or seven years old, which generally speaking, they can't learn at that age, but some can. I mean, I've been surprised by some of them. And then I would have guys in their 60s that were retired, you know. But the, the reason why I slowed it down as much as I did is by the time I would get to the gig, I, I was just kind of phoning it in, you know. If I go play a show, I was phoning it in because I'd already had a guitar in my hands for 11 or 12 Teaching hours. is exhausting. I taught it English in Japan, and I never taught more than 20 hours a week. Yeah. And, and it really wasn't even teaching. It was more conversational. You're, you're right. Goal, I'm, not a, I'm not a graduate English. I don't have an English degree. If you were born in a native, a, a country that English was the native language, U.S., Canada, U.K., Australia, New Zealand, I think that's pretty much all of them, um, you could get a job teaching in Japan. All the rage was Japan then, now it's China. And you're doing conversational. You're teaching with the students. And you have these books with the, you try to teach them. And I actually learned a lot of grammar rules, actually what they were called, because I wanted to be the best teacher I could be. And I studied yeah. the books. Yeah. But you technically, all you had to do was just talk with them and say, you know, no, that doesn't make sense, that phrase, because you know it from hearing it, right? Sure. And um, so it's not like I had to prepare, and the lessons were already prepared. You know, you just followed the book and you went through the order of the book. And, uh, but still it was exhausting. It is. And it's fascinating how much you learn while you teach. Absolutely, yeah. Because there's so many things like, I, there's been things that I've learned in a very uh, connected way that I just connected somehow with automation, like connected by doing it, but never really thought through what it was on a guitar. And you'll have a student say, well, that thing you just did, what is that? Explain it to me. And when you actually have to explain it, then you go, oh, well, now I have to analyze this thing that I was doing with a fair amount of automation, and what is it really? And then when you analyze, you go, holy crap, I can do that all over the fretboard. Because now I actually understand what it really is instead of just this lick. You know, So it's, it's amazing how healthy teaching is for your your performance probably with anything. I mean, you have to teach to stay on your your best game, so to speak. And I noticed it a couple of years ago. I got out of teaching altogether there for a while, and I did notice my playing suffer from it. And then, like, when we started doing the, the ACLG videos, there was so much stuff that came back because I was having to sit down and explain these things that I know how to apply but haven't thought about what they really, really are for many years. And through that explanation, it's almost like you relearn it. But as you're relearning it, there's other stuff you've learned since you learn it that you take it and kind of connect it to this thing. And now it's like, you know what I'm saying. Absolutely. I mean, the guitar is such a wonderful instrument. There's so many things you can do. And people are discovering new things, new ways of making sounds. And, sure. and because it's not like, you know, piano is cool. I love the piano. And because you, you're playing with two hands. So you, you, you've got more notes that are being played. Of course, there are guys that are double tapping. That's right. a kind of a special thing, but but on guitar. But still, you hit. You, what do you do? You hit the you hit the key harder or softer. That's about all you got. Mm. On guitar, oh, you can finger pick it. That's the. You whole... can use different kinds of picks. You can you, all kinds of harmonics. You vibrato. Can, vibr yeah, and what else? I mean, you got gosando, and you've got well. Uh, it's like, 
you can almost do this to a certain extent with piano. Like you can hit the note soft, you can kind of hit it medium or hard, but it's a totally different thing than an electric guitar. Electric guitar, it's like I heard Carlos Santana explain in a Guitar World magazine interview one time that he said it's like a flower. It can be closed or it can be partially bloomed or it can be in full bloom, which is so true because a note, like you can stifle a note. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can yeah sort right, of, right, right. You can sort of open it up or you can completely open it up. Yeah, the, 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 what you do with your, the flesh of your fingers on the string. It's everything. And then your pick between the two of them and the coordinating the motion, you can create all kinds of unique. That's why they say, a lot of guitar, and then the vibrato. I mean, no matter what rig Stevie Ray played through, he's, oh, yes. we were talking about this the other day, he's, he sounded like Stevie Ray. So much of it was in the hands. You know, the, there's been a couple of times that that's hit me upside the head. I th thought that B.B. King, because, you know, we're both blues lovers. Yep. And I had thought that B.B. King had always played a Gibson guitar. And at about... 24, just really, and I was just like eating, sleeping, breathing blues guitar players at that age. About 24, I found out that his early career was a Telecaster. And when you listen to those albums of B.B. playing a Telecaster, it's B.B. King, dude. I mean, it, it, it sounds just like everything else he ever played. And, and knowing that was like, well... Doesn't matter what BB King plays because it really is in BB King's hands. I think, and I, you probably can correct me on this if I'm wrong, but I believe BB King start. He was more of a singer, yeah, who played guitar to accompany himself and to complement his 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 singing. Sure, he started out really mainly as a singer, right? Sure. I mean, yeah, and, and the story went that he couldn't uh, he couldn't get a slide on his finger or he couldn't play slide, one of the two, and he was trying to emulate slide guitar. And that's where the really wide, sweet vibrato came from. He was trying to make it sound like a slide guitar. But his approach of, I sing a line, then I play a line. Call I and response. That's from Call the gospel response. church. That's yeah. the field holler stuff, yeah. too, man. You know, when they're out in the fields, one, you know, yeah. this group of people sings a line, the one's next to them answer. So... I mean, it was the perfect storm that he did it because if not, none of us would be playing guitar the way that. Oh yeah, oh yeah, he did. It was absolutely amazing. He was the catalyst, but, and so was T Bone Walker, man. I mean, those two guys in my mind are the guys that really, really started the whole deal of approaching a guitar. Because you look at the the old school stuff of those jazz albums, the guitar was it was accompaniment. Right, they were right. Playing chords. Yeah, maybe we uh, call it. Yeah. Okay, so. We'll see you next time. Peace.